Hello, and welcome to the Irresistible Marketing Pod, the podcast that doesn't want you to make your metrics mean something that they don't. I'm your host, Issa Gauchi, your marketing confidence cheerleader and owner of the M. Issa Messaging digital marketing agency for small business baddies such as yourself in the fields of health, wellness, personal development, and the creative arts. So today we're going to talk about the gift of slow business growth. And this has been on my heart since the squad voted for how to grow your audience as our theme for February. And as I was putting together the presentation for our masterclass on this topic, I actually felt a strong urge not to get too into the social media algorithms, search engine optimization tactics, and trends several of the squad members had been fretting over and and feeling like they really need to stay on top of these, and that was the most important knowledge they needed to have in order to grow the audience. And why? Because actually not knowing how to game the algorithm wasn't the main problem. Several of them, like me back in the day, were struggling to grow because they weren't taking actions that demonstrated that they were ready to grow. And furthermore, this was such a gift, this pace of their business growth and not the failure that they were interpreting it as. Allow me to explain. What if the current size of your audience matches your current capacity to serve it? I intentionally adopted this thought for a few reasons. One, instead of wondering what I was doing wrong, I get to wonder what important lessons I need to learn before I hit my next growth goal. Two, I get to remember to check in with how it's going serving the people who are already here. How are my business systems doing to accommodate them? How am I emotionally handling the current level of visibility, interaction, and responsibility? Do I have the emotional, energetic, and time bandwidth to welcome in more people? And three, if I find adjustments need to be made in order for me to welcome in more folks and still be able to serve them well without hurting myself, I get to be grateful for the time I have to prepare and make these adjustments before it's an emergency. So here are five ways that slow business growth in the first two two or so years of my business were actually a gift and why if you're growing slowly, that might just be a gift for you too. So number one, tending to a wildfire takes a lot of resources that I definitely didn't have at first. Fast growth isn't always as enviable as you think it is. Because let me tell you, when you get a huge unexpected influx of people, it is actually really stressful learning after the fact that you aren't prepared to serve them. That's what happened to me late last summer when I sold way more 90-day custom content plans than I was expecting. For instance, I had no scheduling limit set up for my acuity scheduler so in one week i wound up with something like seven content strategy workshops for different businesses i needed to prepare for plus since these workshops weren't spaced out my usual deliverable turnaround time within seven to ten business days was suddenly inadequate to turn out all seven plans at once while simultaneously prepping and hosting additional workshops from my other new 90-day custom content plan customers scheduled for the next week and serving my other existing clients. And as I scrambled to keep up, staying up till all hours working, guess what of course happened? I got a migraine, a bad one, and it lasted multiple days, pushing out my timeline even further. I had to tell 10 plus customers that their deliverables would be late. And though I physically couldn't work due to the blinding pain behind my left eye, I went into a huge guilt and anxiety shame spiral because I felt like I was letting everyone down. This was because I hadn't yet done the inner work to be able to trust my people to be good, understanding people. Nor had I done the inner work to stop feeling ashamed for suffering from a chronic illness that is outside of my control. Nor had I done the inner work to realize that other people are allowed to be disappointed in me. And not only could I survive their disappointment, our relationship could survive as well, as long as I was transparent and communicated about delays. So, as you probably surmised from listening to that, that was actually a lot of inner work, and it didn't get done overnight. My nervous system needed to see it to believe it that my people would be understanding. It needed to see it to believe it that we could survive disappointing people or telling people we would be late. 
And thank goodness my business grew at a pace that didn't serve me that situation until I was ready to handle it emotionally, as challenging as it was when it did happen. And thank goodness my next launch didn't sell so ridiculously well, so I had time to process and integrate these lessons, like putting scheduling limits on my calendar, for instance. I think if my business sales and revenue had grown any faster than exactly the pace that they did, I would have burnt myself out and set myself into even more chronic illness episodes long before this one and after that one too, if I didn't give up and quit due to the stress. Here's why. I often don't know where my boundaries are in new experiences. In other words, I often need new experiences to show me where I need to protect and enforce boundaries, and I don't think I'm alone in this. So like putting limits on how many in-depth messaging workshops I host in a week, for instance, I didn't know I needed to do that until I had an actual experience that showed me why I needed to do that. And even if I had an inkling before that happened, I probably would have succumbed to people pleasing and be like, well, I need to accommodate everybody and let them schedule as many as they wanted and then had this thing happen to teach me, no, I like literally need scheduling limits or I won't be able to serve them um, to my full ability. All right, so number two reason why my slow business growth was a gift was I had the luxury of finding boundaries that needed protecting before they got trampled by a stampede. Look, as any recovering people pleaser knows, learning about your boundaries can be, well, messy. (laughs) You don't always communicate them so great on your first or second attempt. And you learn that when you stop people pleasing, people who enjoyed the ways you were accommodating them to your own detriment, detriment, (laughs) they stop being pleased by you. When you stop people pleasing, people stop being pleased with you. Relationships end, leaving room for new connections who are willing to respect your boundaries, but still like relationships ending are painful and tend to dredge up some old wounding. But with the luxury of slow business, business growth, (laughs) but with the luxury of slow business growth, you get to practice identifying and communicating your newfound boundaries without the added pressure of widespread public scrutiny, critique, or backlash. Here are the boundaries I'm glad I had the luxury of the time slow business growth afforded me to process. One, charging an appropriate rate. Two, not overstuffing the scope of work. Three, that I'm not for everybody and getting clear on who I was not equipped or attempting to serve. I'm spilling the deets on each of these, so listen on. All right, so one boundary I learned that I needed to price myself out of resentment. And I think this is especially such a gift for my people who are empathetic, socially conscious, kind folks and have an extreme proclivity for underpricing. Now I am grateful for the business influencers and mentors yelling at them and me that we're worth more and we should raise our prices, which is true. And I know personally that if the price you've named causes your nervous system to go haywire or short circuit, you're not going to sell with confidence you are likely to go into avoidance, which has serious implications for your marketing. And in sales calls, if you doubt the price, you're unlikely to reassure the customer that their investment is safe with you. By the way, I'm sorry for all the rustling. I have um, a puppy the size of a house who's um, fidgety. (laughs) So I say this, price in a way that your nervous system can handle. Bumping it up so that it is a little uncomfortable, but you still believe it's well worth the price is fine. Then do the work. Take on a few of these clients and projects and pay attention to how much effort it entails on your part, how much time, how much emotional labor, how much preparation. When you start to get resentful about delivering what you're delivering at this price, you can raise the price higher because now you fully believe that it is a fair exchange. Here's where slow business growth is a gift. Imagine underpricing and having 50 people, 100 people, hundreds or thousands of people buying it at that underpriced price. You'd be so resentful and exhausted and you'd be playing catch up for quite a while and that would not feel pleasant. All right, second boundary slow business growth gave me the luxury of finding and integrating before it was an emergency was that I needed to narrow the scope of work I was offering so I could stop drowning in work. So I opened my business with like 36 offers. I was constantly making custom packages for whoever came in the door. 
Customers would ask for more than we'd agreed to, and I'd either do it resentfully or have a private meltdown and agonize for hours over how to say no. I had a hard time relaxing because it always felt like there was a deadline hanging over my head. But here's the thing. I needed these experiences to start putting clearer boundaries around what I was offering. I needed these experiences to understand what I actually enjoy doing and what I'm doing out of a financial form of people pleasing. Word to the wise, never try to shape your offer just by what you think they'll buy. Don't factor yourself out like that, please. So thank goodness I had the luxury of understanding I was taking on too much with certain projects when I was serving the 10 clients that bought them rather than two or three times that many. Like, thank goodness, I'm so grateful. I am grateful slow business growth gave me the luxury of time to figure out what I'm actually willing and able to offer without hurting myself or underserving my people. All right, number four gift that I'm really grateful slow business growth afforded me. I learned not to try to be everyone's cup of tea before letting unaligned folks become unhappy customers. So, oh yeah, in theory, it's easy to accept I'm not for everyone. Of course, rationally, I know that my work is not going to be a good fit for every single person out there. But then someone would show up on a sales call and I would want them to like me or the money would be really nice or the prestige would feel validating. And more than once, I found myself twisting and conforming to what they wanted me to be rather than staying grounded in who I want to be. Now that was uncomfortable. It made me feel gross because authenticity is a core value of mine. If I wanted to stuff myself into a little box and stay there, I would have stayed in corporate. And as I diverted a lot of energy to trying to please clients who weren't a good fit, that energy was being sapped from my creative powers. I didn't have as much to give to the work. And yeah, I still got the results, but it wasn't as good as it would have been should I have been on fire, passionate, and aligned with my values in serving them. It took quite a bit of experimenting for it to really sink in that when it's not a good fit, I'm not happy and it's not worth the money. And it took even longer to be able to turn potential clients away for that reason. But boy, am I glad I had the space and luxury to learn that lesson before burning myself out on a flood of bad fit clients and projects. Number four gift that um, slow business growth afforded me. Um, I guess the one before was number three. (laughs) Oops. Anyway, number four. I learned to trust my judgment first before the stakes got too high. So... A little backstory, I grew up a type A straight A student. I longed for that good girl acknowledgement. I loved checking off all the boxes, extra credit included, and for a long time, achieving and overachieving were the only ways I knew how to feel safe. Praise from those I looked up to was the only way I knew to feel validated. It's a shame we train so many young women to source their safety this way because it conditions them so thoroughly for exploitation. Thank goodness my rebel nature kept forcing its way up from the deep, overpowering my people-pleasing and asserting itself whenever I was in danger of conforming into someone other than myself. For a long time, these two urges battled in me. I'd go with one and feel the wrath, disappointment, and fear of the other. I learned in conventional jobs I needed to let the good girl drive win or there would be conflict. But my rebel nature refused to stay quiet for long, so it's no wonder I wound up opening my own business where my rebel nature could finally hold the reins as her own damn boss. But opening my own business thrust me into uncertainty, a plethora of brand new experiences, and that terrified me. And since the only way I knew to feel safe was through the approval of those I admired, I started taking way too much advice and factoring and way too many people's opinions on what I was doing. So to unfortunate results, I took my business mentor's advice, even when I knew it was unaligned with my goals and my people. I tried to do what every expert I came across advised. I took critics' opinions way too seriously, even knowing they weren't who I was marketing to anyway. And I doubted myself when others projected their personal doubts onto me. But... I had the luxury to learn through experience why none of this good girl shit was going to work for my badass CEO me. I had to learn once and for all to trust my own judgment first, to know to my bones that I know what's best for me and for my business. 
And let me tell you, this required a ton of inner work. A lot of revisiting, a lot of very uncomfortable moments in my past, and acknowledging some wounds I had been attempting to ignore for a very long time. If I had blown up quickly, if I had been an overnight success story, there is no way I would have had the space and bandwidth to do this important shadow work, and I'm sure I would have continued to accidentally self-sabotage on an even grander scale to even bigger consequences. As a result of the inner work I had the space to do, as I continue to get bigger and better, I will be equipped to handle way more clients, way more audience, way more visibility, and inevitably exposure to way more people's judgments without letting any of it crush me or knocking me off my game for long. All right, the fifth and final gift I'm so grateful slow business growth afforded me was that I learned to match what I wanted to receive with what I was willing to give before the imbalance left a major debt. So look, I'll admit I've got a pretty tiny audience. My followings across my platforms are pretty small right now. And though I still managed to get tons of customers and those customers became repeat customers and told their friends, for quite a while, I was really, really disappointed by the size of my audience. In 2023, I started really leaning into networking. And I realized that as soon as people meet me, it's really, really easy to sell to them. It's really easy to make friends and have them refer me to people. Like they just have to meet me and like, it's a done deal. I puzzled over why making connections like this seemed to flow so much more naturally to me in my offline life than my online one, even though I'm really good at digital marketing when I'm doing it for other people's businesses. This was the main difference. In person, I reciprocated more, naturally, effortlessly, without even having to think about it. It was a conversation. I listened to them. We exchanged book and podcast recommendations. I congratulated them on their wins and comforted them on their losses. When someone was looking for help, I'd refer a friend I knew could help them. Everything was a lovely, flowing, abundant exchange. Online, I'd just been stomping onto the world internet stage, shouting a monologue, dropping the mic, and piecing the fuck out, then wondering why people weren't following me. But you guys, where is the exchange in that? In relationships, it's bad form to ask for what you're not willing to give in kind. I had to learn a hard lesson about my own entitlement. Yes, my mic drops were so good and they helped the people who were listening, but most of the people listening were ones who already felt heard by me in other contexts. So two years ago, there's no way I would have known to give the squad the journaling prompts that I gave them yesterday. And I'm gonna quote what I put in our private squad Facebook group. A thought regrowing your audience. Are you giving as much as you're asking for? If you want participation, are you participating? If you want vocal appreciation, are you vocally appreciating? If you want engagement, are you engaging? If you want to be heard, are you listening? If you want encouragement, are you encouraging? And if you want people to show up for you, are you showing up for your people? We don't have to do this in an inauthentic way, motivated motivated just to get people to buy. But I think there is something to putting out the energy that we want to attract. Okay, end quote. So thank goodness I had the space to mess up like this, ponder it, and do the deep inner work it, it took to have this clarity that I could share with my paying customers later. If I'd blown up overnight, they wouldn't be getting half so much bang for their buck because I wouldn't have these valuable experiences of learning the hard way so you don't have to, to share. So in conclusion, how do you expand your capacity? If if we're going to go with that thought that the size of your current audience matches your current capacity to hold them, how would you grow your capacity? My favorite way is to just get really good at serving the people who are already there. Learn from the experience of showing up for them and making adjustments along the way. Evolve your business systems, self-care tools, and time management to protect your energy so that you don't unconsciously interpret more customers and followers as a threat to your safety and well-being. The best part? When you get really good at serving the people who are already there, growth happens organically. They tell their friends who become customers, and then they tell their friends, and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, your experiences help you hone your messaging so that your marketing gets better and better results each time you do it. All right. Thank you so much for joining me for today's episode. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And 
Tag me on a post in social media with your takeaways. It's at Marketing Confidence Cheerleader on Instagram and at Confidence Cheerleader on TikTok. And if you could use some help and encouragement incorporating the lessons of wherever you are in your business, join the squad. The squad is my private community of excellently eccentric entrepreneurs cheering each other on as we do the impossible in real time, proving to each other just how inevitable success is for each of us. The squad includes monthly marketing masterclasses on topics voted on by squad members, marketing confidence cheerleading sessions, free copy editing, a private Facebook group to receive support between sessions, and an on-call expert marketing director ready to get her eyes on your actual marketing assets and metrics and strategy and tactics. And that on-call marketing director is me. The link to join the squad and meet your new business besties is in the show notes. I hope you join today or reach out if you have any questions. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this podcast. Drop me a five-star review because it helps me get this free resource to more people who need it, and it makes me feel real good. All right, have a good one.